In episode 441 of the Clive Barker podcast, do we get a little over our heads with academic discourse of Clive Barker? It's possible, but we love it. We talk to Dr. Sorka Neline and Carmel Kniprath of Manchester University about Clive Barker in a gothic context and the experience of creating a feature for the Hellraiser Quartet of Torment, Power of the Imagination. Uh, how many of us wish they had courses like this uh, for us when we were in college? This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and advocate of his art, but Don's unique and inspiring paintings are for sale and over 50% of the proceeds go to the Arts and Medicine program at the Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's even a paver in Washington, D.C. representing Celebrate Imagination. We're thrilled that this worthy cause is sponsoring our podcast again this year, and we hope that you'll consider looking over the Etsy shop to buy one of his original paintings or books. Follow the link in the show notes or click the side banner, and let's see what's new with Don Bertram today. There's some new paintings on the Etsy shop, like the Stargazer, the Folk Singer, the Pearl, uh, Mother and Child 2. Uh, also, don't forget to look at his books, Celebrate Imagination, The Imaginaries, The Chimney Sweep's Tale. In addition, he just revealed a new painting, The Remains, on Facebook. And not really related to Celebrate Imagination, Cl he has two original Clive Barker pieces for sale, The Touch and Fecundity. So contact us or contact Don Bertram directly if you're interested in either of those. <laughs> Welcome, this is episode... 441 of the Clive Barker uh, podcast and uh, and this is a special episode um, we're doing a video episode here because we're uh, we've got uh, Sorka Neeline and Carmel Kniprath uh, today um, and and Sorka we've had you here before because of your book uh, uh, Clive Barker Dark Imaginer uh, but but also and and you and Carmel uh, together you did a featurette called uh, the power of imagination on the on the new uh, quartet of torment. Uh, oh, I'm holding up nothing. Hold on, <laughs> I forget about that. There we go. Wonders of quartet Green of torment. There it Box is. Set. Yeah, thing of beauty. Yeah, the 4K Hellraiser box set that has the first four Hellraiser movies, and this appears on the first disc on uh, with with the first Hellraiser movie, um, you know. And of course, it doesn't just cover uh, Hellraiser movies. This is a you 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 uh, cover the the gamut of of Clive Barker stuff, which is really appreciated. I think in our work, uh, we in our podcast, I mean, we've kind of discovered that. Um, Hellraiser is sort of a splinter faction of of uh, Clive Barker fandom, right? I mean, it's like Clive Barker fans love Hellraiser, but Hellraiser fans don't necessarily love everything that's Clive Barker. Um, you could say that, yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. But but welcome. Um, so I guess I get, first of all, and this was something we were we were talking a little bit uh, a little bit before, but but uh, what? How how did this come about? Um, what what was it that that um, that got this this going this this featurette? Uh, hello. Well, first of all, thank you. That was really kind and a lovely um, introduction. And the, it's lovely to be back. It's great to be back amongst the Hellbound gang. It's always nice. Yeah. Um, so uh so i'm really really grateful that you're, you're you're talking to myself and carmel today um speaking for carmel i apologize <laughs> that's, that's you know but that's the way i'm also so happy to be here <laughs> yeah it's delight it's brilliant like, it's fantastic yeah. um so how did this come about well um i got an uh in, arrow got in touch with me to say they were doing this incredible gorgeous mm. uh quartet uh box set and um that they um they've been made aware of uh, of the barker book the um the dark Madden book because uh 
because there's, there's so few books out there and Barker is just so under under acknowledged in academia something that Carmel and I are mm -hmm. striving to kind of to correct in the world but you know I mean he's 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 there but he's not as appreciated as one would hope he would be um so they had gotten in touch to say they were aware of that um and through some other uh, academics who really wanted to kind of foreground that work so um so we 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 they kind of talked about various things we could do and the interesting thing they hit upon was but well, perhaps maybe thinking about situating his career in in context and thinking about not just Hellraiser which is obviously such an important I think like like a gateway for a lot of people who don't necessarily know know yeah. Clive's work beyond film or beyond horror even um and then thinking about that and then talking about his his uh his you know his career but also the very stages of that career and um well Carmel will, will introduce herself she'll tell you about that but um I I immediately thought of Carmel because of her work and what she's doing uh with me so I thought well we'd make a fierce dynamic duo to talk about it in the academic sense so I'll hand over to Carmel to explain that side of the story yeah, so my PhD um, looks specifically at Clive's um, engagement with the Gothic through his work. So we spoke a little bit about that um, at our time in Liverpool, when we were, or Liverpool, I have Liverpool on the brain at this stage, our time in Blackpool when we were filming the, the documentary. And for me, I suppose that the Gothic is where I hinge on to Clive. And obviously, I suppose it's it's what draws the fans to Clive, I would argue. To, to a degree. Um, it's that facet of his work that keeps bringing us back and certainly keeps bringing me back as an academic and as a, a lover of all his work, I suppose. I was, uh, I was fine gothic in, the, in that respect then. Just I am going to let you take this one, sir, because okay. you're so much more qualified than I am at this stage. It's always the question like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what so how... How do we how do we define the gothic? Okay, mm. right. Okay, I have a get out of jail clause on this one too. Right. So the gothic is anything that can be deemed as claustrophobic, strange, uh, that which renders the familiar world uncanny, secondary worlds, um, the idea of some sort of eruption from the past, the re return of the repressed, all of those things that make the world a little bit darker, a little bit spookier. Um, that's the on that's the way of saying it without sounding completely over dominant in academic language but i do think that you know it's about claustrophobia and the collapse of time and space in order to feel completely um trapped within within your world or your situation so that will be so we can think of the gothic as an as a feeling as a, as a mood as a mode we can also think of it as something aesthetic as well because obviously it does have an aesthetic history to it whether it's associating it with architecture whether it's associating it with in the contemporary sort of cinematic universe with the productions of Guillermo del Toro or um or Tim Burton you know uh, or indeed the, the lineage of Hammer so um so Barker's work fits beautifully within the gothic it it, 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 it calls back to the gothic all the time in terms of monsters who come into our spaces or into our into our lives or or the opening of doors into secondary worlds but um i think that not all not all horror texts are gothic but a lot of gothic texts then start flirting with horror particularly in the more contemporary period of the last 30 40 years so you get this kind of um this steady sort of uh paralleling of gothic and horror and they often sort of intertwine at particular times so uh so as i say it's 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 complicated to answer the question but to kind of give you mm. that mood or that feeling or that sensation that you know of, of unease and uh I'm, I'm, I'm feeling peculiar and ill at ease i think that's that's really what the gothic is trying to do at ah, its heart i hope you. that's some sort of coherent answer no no that's great thank you very much uh you had mentioned yeah I, I was Go ahead, go Sorry. ahead, Ryan. You had mentioned before that there were only a few, um, a few uh, literary books about Clive Barker. I know of uh, Gary Hoppenstant's uh, oh, Imagination as Metaphor, volume. and then, um, and then I know of one other one. I haven't bought it, but it's Suzanne J. Barbieri's uh, Clive. Uh, what is it called? Um, uh, uh, I actually do have that book as well. Clive Barker. Exactly myth Myth maker for the millennium, the millennium. I think from yes. 1994, and yes. uh, and then of course oh I have that yeah Phil and Sarah Stokes books that are that are kind of in between biographical and literary analysis because they 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 come at it from the point of view of where he was at in his life 
you know as yeah it's quite biographically yeah. centered yeah i agree yeah. i mean i, I yeah. wouldn't call it literary theory but that's not not in the dismissal it's just it actually occupies a very different and important part of the kind of yeah. the barker uh, analyses and canon absolutely and then there's yeah. um there's uh, linda badley's brilliant book as well um uh, the oh god gothic horror and the body fantastic I think from it is. the from the british fantasy society i think it was their first book that they released yeah i have a copy of that the oh the barbieri yes yeah yes yeah, yeah. And uh, and then as I say, Linda Badley's one, which is fantastic because it looks at uh, Anne Rice, Stephen King, and Clive Barker as sort of the big three names of the nineteen nineties, and how they all sort of went in very very different ways as it turned out. But yeah, so they're they're kind of the major the major sort of books and publications on that treat Barker as a serious subject yeah. uh, worthy of study. Yeah, yeah. I was and listening it, it to like uh, in the, in the sorry. sorry in the nineties it he was um, he had really blown up, but then since then. Uh, since then, there hasn't been as much kind of literary analysis or or work. I mean, in the in the spotlight, I, I guess you could say. Go ahead, Jose. Oh no, I was Sorry. just going back to that whole gothic thing. I was listening to uh, to Sorka's appearance in the Tales Well podcast this morning, oh. and <laughs> when you get, when you were talking about the characteristics of gothic before you even brought up Hellraiser, I was just like, "Yep, that's Hellraiser." You know the the return of the past to haunt the present with Frank coming in, the claustrophobia of the Ludovico Street house, which I'm standing on right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you are. <laughs> and and all of that, uh, all of the gothic elements that you can kind of identify little things here and there in, in Hellraiser. And not just that, other other things, right? I mean, um, uh, other things in the Clyde Barker uh, body of work um, bring up that uh, kind of gothic elements every once in a while. Um, and it was it was great listening to that featurette and watching it because I rewatched it again this morning. And I think it's great to see academics talking about Clive Barker because it really puts things in context sometimes. And yeah, I always learn something listening to uh, listening to your works or reading your books or reading your papers. And uh, for someone who me and Ryan, who know everything there is to know <laughs> about Clive Barker and then some. Um, but we're not academics. It's always interesting to be able to contextualize certain things and identify that, oh, yeah, there are trends and there are things that we can apply, models that we can apply to this to understand how this is constructed. And it's always very interesting to get that insight. It was funny when when uh, we were watching or I was watching that. And um, when you were talking, when you were comparing Nix to Mamoulian, I was like, because yeah, that was something we talked about in in our in our episodes. In, in, all the time yeah the yeah, damnation game and the lord of illusions kind of got mishmashed together right like yeah. mamoulian became um became nix and uh Absolutely. and it's just yeah. a, an interesting mishmash and one time i think i i tweeted at clive and said something about how mamoulian reminded me of nix and he was like yep right on the money and yep. i was like yep yeah. Oh, I'd like to point out I did not take that idea from here. It's just something that we were we were spitballing when we were talking about. No, the of course, no, no, it's yeah, there. It's, I, I wouldn't. It is I wouldn't. so logically there in terms of the kind of right uh, the nihilism no. and yeah, yeah, this 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 I, desire for this little splink of hope, and you can really really feel that in in damnation game. I think by the time you get to Lord of Illusions, it's not much hope left, but there is this sense of of nihilism and walking into the into the void, which is of something course. that they share so interestingly as characters. So yeah, no, I'm delighted. We're all in agreement. Clearly, all great minds yeah. come together on this. I one, think so. I think ultimately it's even more monstrous of Nick's to want company in 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 the void because I feel like he's. Why does he want someone to go with him in the void? Because he wants someone to empathize with his misery. But ultimately, he's bringing someone else into the void, which makes him more monstrous. I would, I would argue, right? Yeah. But there's well, also that. Uh, that's, yeah. I suppose, that dimension of that need for friendship and mm -hmm. you know to dispel the loneliness is what I often come to to Clive's work with this hopeful optimism that is always at play within. The gothic, his gothic is very, very hopeful. And it's that, yeah. like, it's Catherine Spooner's happy gothic model, isn't it? Just suitably twisted to suit his imagination, I think. Well, and it was also him trying to wrap his head around uh, that cult mentality, right? Where, you know, trying to, where they want to kill everyone else and leave themselves for last and, and uh, leave... You know, so in in that case, Swan was, I'll kill you. You know, you know, I'll, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll kill you when this is over. I have to, but, um, but until then, but, it's just you and me. 
But when it's a cult, the the cult figure, the uh, the leader, always dominates everybody else, and uh, yeah, takes them on the. He creates the universe that they live in. He creates the rules that they follow, and uh, ultimately, he uh, makes their fate his fate. So he's gonna direct them into that uh, what they think is going to be an illumination but in the case of Nyx is not not so much that it's more um yeah. let's go all into the void together and suffer together yeah i also yeah. i also think when you're thinking about damnation game you think about mamulian and whitehead when they have that confrontation it's sort of like the last little vestige of fri feeling fragile or feeling vulnerable i suppose is the word yeah. in terms of humanity it's that last tiny yeah. speck of humanity left it's the i'm afraid to walk into the void on my own and oh, you're like yeah. okay so it's not even about just the things that you expected those kind of dominant characters of you know bullying this sort of uh, inferior character the one who's deemed to have less power in the situation but it's actually that sense of i'm, I'm scared and to say that i'm scared is is quite a human thing from yeah. a character who's become increasingly sort of ethereal and made strange by by virtue of his immortality. So I thought that was that was incredible actually that moment to kind of dig for that little that little speck of humanity was really quite profound and quite and quite bizarrely quite moving actually in the damnation. Yeah. I found that to it, be quite it, a moving it really made me think like if if I was two hundred years old would over the years would I get more and more afraid of death? I maybe. Sure. And even Whitehead yeah. also reflects a little bit of that of fear of going into the dark because he knows the price is going to get charged. He knows that he's going to have to pay that price. And he has that crazy like dinner party in the book where it's very nihilistic. It's like, well, you know, let's just drink all the wine from the cellars and let's just, you know, um, this is it. Um, but and then, of course, Mamoulian comes. And uh, mm. but it's it's an interesting um an interesting uh, book, The Damnation Game. I think it's a little underloved and underappreciated, but I think people really should, uh, if you like Clive Barker, I think everybody should read The Damnation Game because it's really is the first time he threw himself at a big novel mm. and he put yeah. a lot of his themes into it. I, I personally, it, it, it it's one of my like favorites. A, so yeah, it, it reads like a long form Books of Blood story. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I, there we go. I do, yes. So I teach it on our master's course um, on, on, on at a, a Manchester Met, Metropolitan University. I teach it on the MA in Gothic. And what's interesting is that of a lot of students, uh, Carmel aside, of course, because Carmel knew who Barker was long before I long before <laughs> I came on the scene. And um, a lot of students though who are like uh, who don't necessarily know Clive, Clive at all. And when you say, um, you know, have you heard of this person? They're like, mm, maybe. And then when you say, you know, Pinhead or Hellraiser, they go, oh yeah, that guy. I'm like, well, actually, he's an author <laughs> yeah, as well God. as a film maker and an artist and yeah. all these other cool things but when we talk about when i get them to read the damnation game what a lot of them tend to say whether they go on to read more barker or not they all say it's an incredibly cinematic book and i think that's a very fair analysis of it it's so visually arresting it's so yeah. it's so gothic it's so bleak in terms of the way it illustrates london and and and, and 80s england and thatcher thatcher england and i think that it's um it's a wonderful kind of timeless story in so many ways, but it's really rendered quite explicitly and quite visually. So um, they really kind of come away with that. They often get quite kind of horrified by the violence in it, but I actually think it's quite bleak and funny and, mm. and, and strange and very lyrical and incredibly beautifully written book. So it's, it's definitely one of my favorites. So yeah, it's staying on the course and definitely as yeah. far as I'm concerned. So it's a great yeah. gateway text actually. Mm. I agree. Yeah, it is. And I knew I knew you were happy when we were doing it. You were yeah. you were gleeful <laughs> and rightly so. I think people could see just how how joyous it is to read Barker's work, you know, from, you know, when you somebody else in a room who really wants to talk about that seriously, it, it does spread the idea. And and we did we did make get a few few more Barker fans out of the whole MA as well, which was decent. So good. Yeah. In in the uh the featurette you guys go into um how Clive's uh themes one of them is the escape into imagination, right? And of course, we can bring in like Weave World or The Thief of Always or any of his books, really. I mean, there was always um, a daily, a, a world situation where someone is, you know, turns a corner and all of a sudden they they come across something that is completely out of bounds with reality. And it's going to take them on the ride and it's going to take us on a ride and change us and change the main character, right? It, it always starts small. And it goes into almost infinity. Like, look how Magica starts, right? It's just a, a, 
a, a, a fake painter who just makes copies of, you know, famous works. And it just seems like a petty criminal, you know, and then all of a sudden we have like the death of God at the end of the book. It's, it's just, <laughs> yeah. it takes yeah. you on that weird line. And in the midnight beat train, there was this perfect, sentence that clive says in this uh um short that he he has a short feature right where he's showing his paintings and he said um i think this is a great uh sum of what clive thinks his themes are he's talking about this little spiral that he drew on a on a cake plate made out of paper and he's just going from the humble spiral and he talks about how without breaking a line it takes you from the tiny to the immense it takes you from the inside to the outside it takes you from the imagination to the real. And he says, and I stress without breaking a line, and that's what I'm trying to do in my fiction. I'm trying to take the reader by the hand and take him out or her here at the edge of the spiral. And then without breaking the surface of the known reality and violating their understanding of what the real is, slowly coax them, seduce them into a place which is richer and darker, more mythic and more full of echoes and mysteries and profound innocence and profound guilt and evil. And finally, into oneness, which is right at the heart of things. And that's just, he said it. I mean, that's you can just look at that. And immediately, I think of the Magica with a circular map where everything just is a one yeah. ring, and all, all of those themes in there. I mean, you can't, flo you can't fault him for ambition. You know, you I know, really yeah. Can't. Like that is yeah. Same with Aberat. Aberat's the ultimate escape into yeah. imagination, right? You're not just escaping right. the world into a fantasy world you're you're escaping into a world that's birthed into all these paintings into all of these um creative vignettes and that mm -hmm. they just kept coming and it became this huge like epic that uh, we hope to see finished uh, sometime soon but uh, Aberat's like really like the most complete um blakean sort of you know work that clive's ever made with all of those paintings and all the text well, even mm. even the even in weave world there's gyres are sort of touched on in 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 weave world as well are you, are you talking about where the 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 carpet gets weaved out of yes yeah i yeah, think that looms, isn't yeah. that the that's kind of a i thought that was a spiral the spiral at the center yeah. of it yeah it's a spiral yeah, yeah it's like a yeah. Uh, yeah that's true yeah that's it's always like this big spiral. The magic could be considered a spiral almost. But it's interesting the way that we get immersed yeah. into this world slowly and slowly. And ultimately, we accept the the, the crazy and boundless things that happen in Clyde Barker's stories uh, because he brought us here in, in a way that didn't break a line. So you mm -hmm. believe that the guy who's chasing a pigeon at the beginning of Weave World is the guy who ultimately is going to be at the center of this huge reality with all these like magic creatures around him immersed mm -hmm. into a fantasy world. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. But um, another one of the most famous Gothic characters or monsters is the vampire, right? So mm -hmm. um, that pops up a lot in Clive Barker's work as well. I mean, I know he subverts a lot of um, stereotypes and monsters, right? So we have, Things like the, the vampire or the zombie, you know, for example, in Damnation Game, Breer uh, yeah. is the zombie uh, who doesn't know he's a zombie, which is, is it's just really funny. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's really disturbing, right? but it's yeah. really funny. You know, like, yeah. when, when he's sitting in his kitchen, eating human flesh and crying because he's sad and you're like, Oh, uh, yeah. one of my favorites zombie. when he's I think he's getting the bus, I think it is in we in, in the I'd have to reread it, but I think he's getting the bus and everyone's kind of moving away from him and he just ends up dousing himself in more sort of cologne to kind of yeah. cover the smell and he's clearly yeah. you know decaying. It's it's again, but it kind of makes you think I've been on a London bus on a wet afternoon, and yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. You know, so yeah. um it's got that kind of familiarity and hilarity to it, but at the same time, this yeah. kind of disgust and sadness kind of woven into it really really um, yeah and, and, the, and that um and that tra transition into his point of view where mm. he's trying to think and his brain is rotting yeah. it's a uh, yeah it's sort of uncomfortable and... like you're, you're so you're so drawn to Breer and yeah. you sympathize with Breer and you, you come away feeling very conflicted over your yeah. experience as you follow him through the book so if I could bring a little bit more about Carmel's work into the conversation, you're doing your PhD thesis, and at the title of it is Always Worlds Within Worlds, Clive Barker's Transmedial Gothic, 1978 to the Present. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about how you're tackling this theme? Oh, 
yeah um it's a difficult one it's very hard to box Clive up neatly into an 80,000 word project um but we're having great fun I think as we're doing it um I'm really enjoying the process first and foremost and it's it's immersing yourself back into Clive's worlds and um discovering new things all the time so I'm being led by the gothic first and foremost but another component of my PhD is his transmedial element so I'm very interested in how Clive uses the gothic um, and how he uses the gothic to approach certain mediums uh, such as literature theatre film plastic arts and so on and what he does with the gothic to change these mediums and to alter their parameters essentially so I'm quite interested in, um, I've just finished up my uh, chapter on theatre at the moment and how like Clive's, Clive's use of the Gothic within that medium is fascinating, particularly towards the end of the British 1970s where we don't really see Gothic theatre um, being staged as much, I suppose. So he brings that element, it's all, all new and it's all quite radical. But, but you see for the first time that these really really complex monsters start to appear uh, Frankenstein and love for example you see El Coco's body um, is crafted out of we were talking earlier about out of um, paper mache and latex and they're these really highly complex figures that we see appear again in in Hellraiser for example like Frank's body is another iteration of of El Coco I see Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I, it, I, it's just really, really fascinating, really, really fascinating work. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And, and have you seen his uh, early work uh, with uh, with his friends when they made uh, the Forbidden uh, short film and uh, Salome? Yes, I've seen clips here and there on YouTube, but I haven't seen the full feature actually. Oh, oh well, we'll have to find a way for you to see that. Uh, the yeah, forbidden, we need to sort her out with that one, Lutz. <laughs> yeah, the forbidden in particular is um, you can see where the whole uh, skinless uh, person comes from. It comes from yeah. uh, Vesalius's uh, book about mm -hmm. the human body. And mm -hmm. I think that really the must have impressed. The flaying of Marseilles, isn't it? The painting as well. The flaying of Marseilles reminds me right. of that. You know, yeah. yeah. So you can see the sort of anatomy and at the same time there's some sort of there's a spectacle kind of reading off that painting that's quite horrifying at the same time really fascinating because everyone kind of wants to peer in but it's still quite you know affronting so yeah absolutely and then in the forbidden the angels come and skin the guy and they made that with the layers of paint on on the body of peter atkins and then they cut through the layers of the paint and it looks like they're actually skinning the body which is uh it's pretty well done, actually. And they painted different designs on each layer. So when they pull out the paint, you see what it looks like to be bones and muscles. Um, and then film and you have the, the, the nail board as yeah. well, which is a board full of nails all squared out where the light is playing around with it. And uh, you can see that in Pinhead's face, you know, the hell priest's face, you know, with the nails and all that. So definitely there's this, these concepts are floating around and that, you know, those big fish are circling around in Clive's ocean mine, and then he just comes in and picks those fish up and just puts them out. And it's just amazing. And and uh, going back to the plays really quick, Jose just showed them off here, but also just wanted to make sure people know you should go to uh, the Clive Barker archive. People should buy these because they're not very expensive and they're books on the individual plays. And right now there are uh, six of them. Yeah, I think six. That's right. Yeah. And uh, we, but, we have th three that were that have been previously published and three that were never published before. And so um it's the least expensive best way to get uh, Clive Barker's plays. There are also the two previously, you know, published books, the um in Forms of Heaven and Incarnations. Um but so, the, the, these continue, will continue to be published as far as we know. They're, they're still working on them. That's excellent. Is that Phil and Sarah producing those? That's the really, yeah. that's important. Yeah. That's great. That's fantastic yeah. work. Yeah. Great. Um, so, yeah, going back to the vampire, like, um, for example, we see that uh, Frank and Julie are kind of vampires. You know, they suck the blood out of their victims. Um that comes up in a lot of uh, stuff in Clive Barker. Um, uh, the idea of this 
seductive vampire, bad boy vampire like Frank. Um, There's the story human. Is it human remains? The one with mm -hmm. the yeah the the yeah that's almost like a bathtub. It's almost yeah. like a retelling yeah. of a golem story, right? So that's yeah. that's yeah. the interesting thing that he kind of subverts these original monster ideas that we have and puts them. Yeah. Even has one with werewolves. Uh, I think it's a right. Twilight at at the Towers. Yeah. That it's about werewolves trained by Secret Service uh, to be <laughs> secret agents, which is yeah. kind of like a, an outsider in the books of blood. But it's yeah. it's super fun. I wish they would do a movie about that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a favorite vampire iteration from Clive? Oh. Um, Mr. Hood is my favorite from Thief Oh yeah. Of yeah, I was thinking Thief of Always as well, but also when Harvey gets transformed, you yeah. know, into oh, a vampire. Yeah. I love that whole sequence, you know, and this yeah. and a gorgeous drawing of Harvey with the bat wings that I I'm seriously considering as a tattoo. But you know, it's it's just so beautiful and so yeah. um the power that the sense of power that he's almost drunk on, you know, when he's running around the back garden, um, terrorizing the sort of the, um, the other kids. It's brilliant. I love it. You know, it's, um, and it's probably the most explicit image of a vampire that Clive, because Clive likes to shy away from maybe using what we consider cliche. Yeah. So the fact that he kind of goes towards it, but then from the point of view of a child and having that much, that much ability to kind of terrorize others and then being frightened of that power. I thought that was really quite an interesting turn with that so that was my first ever book signing that i went to with clive and oh, he man. read that chapter uh to oh. the audience and so that was like for me that's like that's really special i love that book oh yeah i love that book as well i think that's a a, a stunner i mean really it's the yeah. kind of thing that if i know anyone with small kids i'm like <laughs> give them, when yeah. they're right age read that to them they'll love it you know so yeah yeah, here we are speaking during the month of the Great Grey Beast February. Um, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but he, uh, Harvey Swick doesn't just uh, dress up as a vampire. Mr. Hood is kind of a, a time vampire of sorts. Like he sucks out the life and the years out of everybody who's in the house, right, uh, to yeah, take his we're, power. We're all half devoured, right? So this is the, what is this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 24. And it's funny because then we yeah. got echoes of Mr. Hood in uh, Hepexamendios in Imagica. Uh, another powerful monster that makes his body out of, you know, the city of God. Yeah. And uh, so th there's always like these little echoes that you can see going through Clive's work. And, and yeah. it's well, interesting and not, how... Not just echoes, in Thief of Always, it's spelled out, right? He says yeah. evil is always undone, you know, by by its own appetite. I mean, that's... He, he couldn't make it more clear. I mean, he, he, hmm. he, just, he, he just comes out and tells you in that book because it's a fable. I mean, he says right mm -hmm. on the book that it's a fable. Mm -hmm. I like the the part where you guys discussed uh, the spaces that we see in Clive's work. Uh, I think that was also very interesting to discuss that. Um, in Clive's story, there's always these magical spaces like Midian in Nightbreed, for example, um, a city where everything is fantastic. Everything is non-human, non-Earth-like, non I mean, non-real. Um, you have a whole like city full of the last remnants of the great tribes. And especially if you go into that little book, Hellraiser Chronicles, then you see all of them like with little bi biographies for each monster. And you mean <laughs> yeah. Nightbreed it, Chronicles? It's, it's even a, a bigger expansion on, on the whole thing. But uh, I, I really thought that that was my first, apart from Hellraiser, I think that was the, the book that got me more in, into collecting Clive Barker was Nightbreed at the time. Um, I, the Cabal was the first novel I think I got from Clive. And um, and it's, yeah, and it just kind of calls out to you, right? I mean, that's, Clive kind of seduces you into these worlds by showing you that there is something outside that has always been there and you can always go there, which I guess you could argue it's the kingdom of your imagination, but with Clive, it, it really is, you get immersed in these books and... Um, it really, it really takes you on a big journey that sometimes you don't get out of other authors. But um, I, I really have a blast reading stuff like Imagica, mm -hmm. and yeah. Um, what was your first novel or experience with Clive? I'm trying to remember, and I can't, I can't remember. Well, was my first as well. Well, was your first as well? Or, yeah, I stumbled upon it upon it in a secondhand bookshop. I think right. it was maybe 14, 15. Ah. Um, that picture of Clive. Um, there's a couple of books from what I remember. 
and there was this really really beautiful picture um oh is it the Annie Leibovitz one it is yes the black the and white Annie Leibovitz photograph oh my god yeah yeah I agree with you completely. We all he was the most it. he was the most beautiful horror writer by some distance yes that's true uh, the Linda McCartney photo is pretty good too yeah oh yeah it is yeah, it yeah. is pretty now the Leib there's something in the Leibovitz one is just oh my god oh, yeah. it's stunning yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean at that yeah. stage I never had seen Hellraiser I had no no Clive Barker knowledge and it was the world building and I think that's mm. what draws me back to him every time the complexities and the richness of the worlds that he builds and the fact that they're left open at the end of every text that you can you're invited back all the time you know I, mm. I love that that's so interesting because the three of you Cabal was your gateway one way or the other um, mine was Weave World actually, and I'd I'd seen Hellraiser uh like the 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 video cover quite you know quite prominently as a kid, and it you know scared the living bejesus out of me as a child. But then um when I you know found that I found out he was an author, and then I found that he was that that these things were actually based on novels. I was like, wow, this is fantastic. But Weave World because I remember the reading the opening paragraph, um, mm -hmm. but particularly nothing ever begins the opening sentence, and I thought to myself, oh hey, no, I'm. I'm already in. <laughs> Tell me more. And uh, <laughs> yeah. but that opening paragraph is possibly one of the most beautiful paragraphs I've ever seen to open a novel. It's just moving and philosophical and powerful and lyrical. I mean, he's such a beautiful writer. Yeah. So it was uh, it completely seduced me by the end of that first page. So, um, yeah, so it became quite it is it still is quite an important novel to me. So Weave World was my first novel of his. And then I went and watched the films and then kind of worked through the catalogue then, you know, so. Yeah, it's quite an experience moving from something like the Books of Blood into Weave World into a mm -hmm. magic. It's quite yeah. a journey. Yeah, he always just he, just he always has some surprise for you though. Whenever there's a new Barker book, you're like, I don't know where this is going to land. Is it going to be within dark fantasy? Is it going to be horror yeah. again? Is it going to be something completely different? And yeah. he always he always surprises you. That's a nice thing, you know. There's always and, something and waiting. And I and think it is people hard to have to be find. flexible to to appreciate that because th there are people that want to put him in in a horror box, or or mm -hmm. um, or people that that say, "Hey, you started you started something with the books of the art, or you you promised that Cabal was going to be a trilogy, you know, and and um and they it's like, hey, you need to finish these things, and you know, where is this? Where is that? And you know, what happened to Aberat Four? And um, they, you just, but when you're a Clive Barker fan, I feel, you know, we've talked about this a lot on our podcast, but I, you know, I feel like you just kind of have to ride the waves and go with the flow and, and see what comes. Yeah. That's true. Well, absolutely. I'm... Yeah. Um, you have to, um, you have to be very patient. And um, this is not one of the things that Clive Barker says, um, in the Midnight Meat Train featurettes is that, uh, so he goes on to say how, he's talking more about his painting, but I think this would also uh, fit with his uh, works, written works and photography and all that. He says, um, it takes time to make this stuff. It just takes time. Uh, if you don't put your blood and sweat uh, into what you're doing, uh, into what you're creating, it's not going to be worth the damn. And um, so these things sometimes take time to, you know, come together and gel together and gain the physical form and be able to put it out there. So the thing about being a Clyde Barker fan is you have to be, um, you have to be patient. You have to accept that the artist will write about whatever is in his mind at the time. And uh, it's not always like a, a assembly line of like first chapter, let's do the second book. Let's do a trilogy. It's not, sometimes things get in the way, especially yeah. in a, such an organic mm -hmm. kind of um, method that he has for writing that, you know, often sometimes a story will run off from him and become something completely independent. Yeah. And, and, and Disney and that, thought that know. Aberrat could be their Harry Potter, you know? Oh like, my God. Can you imagine yeah. if that had gone through, if that had happened? Yeah. I, it's one of the biggest, like exciting moments of my fandom was when the news came out that, Oh my God, Disney is going to option, you know, Aberrat to, to yeah. make something. And I was like, yes, finally. Why do you guys think it's so hard to adapt Clive Barker stuff? There are no machinations, I don't think, to, yeah. to really capture the full the full expanse of his vision. I don't think it's yeah. it's not possible. We see it 
we see him on film spent we've had loads of conversations circa yeah between how like cinema is possibly the most limiting medium for barker yeah in terms of duration it has a lot of constraints uh due to commercialism and how long will people sit to watch a movie yeah. i mean nowadays we live in the age of streaming and and mini series and you know i I just don't understand how we don't have more projects actually coming to completion regarding Clyde Barker properties. Even though we did get that new Hellraiser from Hulu, what did you guys think about that? Enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was, okay. I thought it was one of the better contributions to the Hellraiser universe. And one of the ones that I enjoyed a bit more. I mean, I'm obviously counting the first three as sort of canon if we can, if we can use yeah. that word. Um, but uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I thought the story in itself was was fine. It was logical. It fit into it. I like the design quite a lot as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that's not gonna necessarily win me any love and praise. But I really thought the um, Cenobites could have done a lot more. Mm -hmm. I didn't think mm -hmm. that they were um, active enough within the narrative because I felt like they were there. They were part of that uh, world building. I thought they were part of that aesthetic, but I didn't feel they were actually contributing to the the horror kind of felt kind of self self-inflicted <laughs> by the they end they were of it, almost you know like I mean? kind of a greek choir so, kind of character right yeah well, there, there, yes there, like there a were chorus a lot actually of them, yeah. Yeah. yeah when yeah. they had a really small amount of time on screen yeah too know, little yeah. too little screen yeah. time to really kind of because yeah. I, I mean it shows you though that screen time isn't everything because obviously in hellraiser you're building and building and building towards that yeah. and and we got a lot more screen time i suppose in in, in hellbent but yeah. Um, I just felt that even though they were there, it just wanted them to be more sort of agentic or, you know, active within the narrative. And they, and they weren't. And I kind of thought, oh, this is a shame because I've been waiting so long to see what you're yeah. going to do with this. So, so I, I enjoyed it, but it was, it felt like it still didn't have the kind of the lofty heights of the first three for me anyway, hmm. you know, so, um, and I think can I go voice... back to just yeah, to what you're making about ad adapting Barker? And this is something that. Carmen and I discuss all the time about his mm -hmm. work as she's writing her doctorate is that it, film in particular is such a collaborative medium you've often hundreds of people in the journey of a film from an idea to a final product and I think that if you're sort of someone with a quite a, a distinctive strange but in a beautiful way imagination trying to get other people to necessarily collaborate with that can be very frustrating for the person for the visionary themselves and i think that that's one of the things that prevents the adaptations always feeling as successful i mean if he wants to tell you a story like cold heart canyon which is one of my favorites as well you know he sits down he writes it it feels biographical it's funny it's I've got a big story it's got a gothic center to it and you know you publish it you read it you enjoy it mm -hmm. but it's it's one person and possibly a literary editor and a couple of other people involved whereas with film it's much more collaborative there's much more money involved and I think that that can by its very nature limit something that is a very in some case in, in his case very personal I think vision of what his stories are there so are I don't think they always lend themselves that way yeah. yeah yeah I think so too yeah so um, so I think that's one of those those limits. I think even with theatre, you know, you have fewer people to worry about and you can always think about it as a company or as a medium that is different and, and, and perform differently every night. So it feels organic every night that you perform it. Whereas with film, it has to be to be right, to be produced and to be commercialized for years and decades to come. So there is there is there are other constraints just by virtue of the medium. You know, we had an episode where and I... Sorry, right. Sorry, uh, we, we had an episode where Jose and I discussed a, a, a film, an unfilmed adaptation of The Damnation Game oh, uh, by okay. Anthony de Blasi, who made the... the that, it wasn't good. Breer drove a yellow Lamborghini, just to give he you was an a, idea. He was an an oh. an Lamborghini dealer. Yeah, a Lamborghini dealer. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Well, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, not all adaptations uh, are good. No, no uh, not necessarily. But uh, I'm just back, trying to get that image out of my mind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, just, but, it's quite something. Oh yes, uh, that that was wild. It was a wild. And it, adaptation. it had the uh, it had bullhorns on the on the front of the Lamborghini. On the front of the Lamborghini. Lamborghini. That's yes. insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't um, do that to the Lambo. My God, what did it do to I you? Know. Yeah. yeah. But if Cold Heart Canyon. Bad adaptions. We need. We need to really, really discuss raw head wrecks at this point. Yeah. Oh yeah, raw yeah. Head. That, that would be that would be perfect for a remake. Those are the kinds of movies that you remake, right? The ones that were, you know, yeah. that had really great 
stories behind them, but didn't quite didn't quite make it, you know, and didn't quite first run get there. Yeah. But didn't for example, uh, Transmutations, uh, the mm -hmm. first book based on a Clyde Barker script that was uh, that came out recently in 4K, if you can believe it. Um, it it uh, it also has echoes of Nightbreed and it has echoes of Weave World because it's a bunch of Morlocks that live under the ground and they're all in this, you know, weird drug that makes their dreams come true and externalizes them on their, you know, appearance. And then at the end, the original script had a Dr. Sa uh, Savory who would have like hypodermic needles come out of his face in the original script. And uh, that calls towards Pinhead. So there's always this echo of these these big bang echoes that echo throughout mm -hmm. all of Clyde Barker's work and uh, mm -hmm. repeat these little topics like Cold Art Canyon, another space that is kind of based on almost on, on Clive's own house in, in the canyon. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. All, yeah. All Absolutely. Of those when you're walking through it and you're reading the book, well, if you're reading the book and then you can, if you've been through the space, you can walk yeah. through it and actually map it on because you're like, I, you know, I know that door, or I know that spiral staircase or whatever it might be. So it does feel biographical but at the same time fantastical so it's just like it stretches that space and makes it again makes it gothic makes it weird yeah. and strange and magical so you know and, and show us the the haunted hollywood with all of the oh, echoes yeah. of all the, the actors that lived in it i think clive or or the seraphim office used to belong to a actor i think his last name was i think it was robert culp and it's funny because if you ever visited that house, there's like secret passages in the house too. It's yeah, like there was yeah, a yeah. bedroom that had a door that led to a hallway. And I was like, oh, it's it's yeah. just funny that the, the spaces that you see in Clive's work and how they reflect to to places that he lived in, like Liverpool and all that stuff. And London as well. I mean, again, Crouch and yeah, you can feel that. Too, exactly. You know? yeah, I mean, yeah. so yeah, it is, it is there, this sense of kind of, again, it's that gothic ethereal nature of it, you know, um, and, and, and he's aware of it. He brings it to the fore in the, in his writing, you know, but I mean, as, as, as this is exactly what Carmel's work is doing as well. It's about identifying those, those repeated themes and patterns and what transforms a text into a Barkarian text. And I think that's what makes it so interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that he's able to literally transform that media, you know? And I've always for thought- Carmel again, I apologize. <laughs> you can do it, <laughs> but you and know. I, yeah, but I always thought that uh, Clive kind of, there's a self insert of Clive and Magic and Gentle, I guess. I mean, I always saw, I always saw Gentle as looking a lot like Clive in my mind. I, I don't know why, but- it just seems like a lot of what he puts into gentle is is something that is inside Clive as well. I guess that's true of every author, but I think in that case, it it really is, feels like a self insert in the Magica. I think I think a lot of authors are, for better or worse, they they either put in a version of themselves or a, fant a fantasy version of someone with whom they are enthralled or are in love with. You see that with, with with many authors across many genres. So it's nice to have that little once you identify those kind of autobiographical flares. I mean, you see this with Dan Brown as well. I'd like to point out, it's not always just uh, the great and the good. You know, you see this all the time. So um, yeah, I think it hooks it on for the authors, makes it makes it real. Brings them well, back into that circle. In sort of a meta textual way too, in in that he, you know, he 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 holds the world in his imagination and and releases it and and rewrites the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what he likes yeah. to do. He likes to reimagine it and re reassemble it in his own way, yeah. and and also then bring us into those gorgeous, infinite, strange secondary worlds. Yeah, you know. That's that's always the thing you're looking for is where's the door because there's going to be a doorway at some point into a secondary world into which you you may forever you know spend your destiny. So I still hope that one day someone will come up with a great Clyde Barker unified theory where we put all of the mythology. Oh, you're looking evolved. at her. She's going to do it. Don't oh, you, Carmel. Yes, <laughs> please. A theory of everything. A theory of Barker and everything. Right. Know? That'd be terrific. Because look at this, we, we even have Cenobites in Weave World, they're the surgeons from beyond, so they're there. And yeah. then, you know, you can just make all sorts of connections. Uh, yeah, right. it's the, the Dream amazing. Sea could also connect to the Sea of Isabella. Hey, that's the thing that imagination is the limit. And yeah. by that, I mean, there's no limit, you know. <laughs> yeah. You can you can think up whatever you want and just put these things together and, and see how they work. That's That's the good part. But uh, what other projects are you guys working on right now? At Carmel, I know you're still working on your thesis, so that's definitely taking up a lot of your time. It is uh, just my focus at the moment. So I have another year left. So 
That's me again in 12 months and we'll see where we are. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and you'll be doing a back. conference paper, won't you, Carmel? You're doing a conference yeah, paper for, yeah. for me. Do you want to tell them what it's on? <laughs> yeah, oh God, I don't even know yet. But I'm I'm lo- I'm toying with the idea of looking at transmedia gothic and maybe some abandoned uh, adaptions and sequels and stuff. So I've not been set in stone yet, Sarah, but we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> Oh, you will. Yeah, absolutely no problem at all. So uh, I'm well, I'm I'm doing too many things as as is my way. Uh, so I'm working on a longer, larger project on the Gothic 1980s more generally. And that's a project that's still three to five years in, in, in you know, it's it's a very long project. Uh, so I've just been in the US doing some work on that. Um, I'm co-authoring a book on the cinema of Robert Zemeckis at the minute. And I'm running a conference on um, Gothic sequels from the 1980s, um, that, which will be in June in Manchester in the UK. So that will oh, be, wow. which will have a Barker element, thanks to Carmel. But also we'll be talking about lots of other sequels that came out of 1980s properties. So sequels, multiverses, trilogies, etc. Um, I'm thinking about that. I'm going to be working a lot on um, Beetlejuice 2. Oh, and there's, a yeah. lot, there's a lost sequel to Beetlejuice 2, which I've read. So I'm right. going to talk a bit about that. So, yeah, so it's all it's all there. These kind of wonderful, gorgeous monsters made strange really erupt in the 1980s. And that's uh, that's something that I really want to kind of chart over the next few years. So um, so I've no intention of leaving that decade <laughs> for another <laughs> <All> while. <right. laughs> there is just so much good stuff that came out of that. There was so much stuff that people were, you know, just so many movies that were experimental and things that you had never seen before. And then the nineties also, there were a lot of experimentation in, in horror movie and genre movies, but then it just feels like things just kind of slow down a little bit. And now it's, it's the indie directors that are bringing stuff like that to the, uh, to the fore. Um, But looking forward to all those uh, um, projects that you mentioned and keep us posted on those conferences. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Carmel, we'd love to have you again whenever you uh, you're done with your thesis. We'd love to have you again. Yeah, and um, where can where can people follow you, or or how would you want people to 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 see what you're what you're doing? Oh, I my Twitter page is Goth Milk. Um, okay. And so at it's Carmel Knipperth on Instagram. Okay. So at Goth Milk G O T H Milk with two L's. And an, and an underscore, I think. Yeah, G O T H okay. underscore M I L L K. That's it. Yeah, I saw when you guys posted about uh, in October when you got the the box, the beautiful Hellraiser themed oh. obelisk from Isn't Arrow. It? Yes, it's gorgeous. Can and I that, give you guys that book? Yeah, mm. yeah, that no, that but that box that came out was utterly stunning. I mean, what I can't wait for the next box production. that's going to come out in six months. <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's yeah no it's when you get it oh my god it's just a, a work yeah. of art it really truly is but um can i tell you guys something that was absolutely hilarious that happened as hellraiser and clive related so when i was in um la um a couple of weeks back um i uh i had a lovely evening with um the fantastic peter atkins and we were having a great chat about um about this and about you know hellraiser and writing sequels and all the rest of it because i'm going to include him in the sequels work that I'm doing because yeah. you know Hellbound is such a profoundly important film and, and so much fun um but one thing I did discover and realize and I don't know if your authors or re- sorry your, your readers or if you guys have come across this before is I actually managed to watch a Indonesian remake of Hellraiser called Ro yeah. from 1989 Ro. it is fantastic I mean Wild, I know it's right? got a budget of about 500 quid but yeah. they really <laughs> did the best that they possibly could but using the particular subtitles from Hellraiser yeah. using the character names I mean it was completely lifted um but it was it was a wonderful sort of transmedial international version of thinking about Clive but um and, and the work but I did love the fact that every time they mentioned the box um it was an orb on screen so it was no more a box than anything <laughs> right. else but I, I did find that quite quite amusing but watching Roe was quite an experience so you you never Ro. you're never done with Clive are you you always find him popping up somewhere yeah. which is R-O-W you, you, R-O- you start R-O-H. out with a, that R-O-H. Frank with a mustache Frank with a mustache <laughs> in a circle of candles and uh it's, it's oh yeah it's, I mean we've they all, really do we've all seen some like great moments derivative. in it you know yeah yeah, the torture pillar, and uh, I think they actually lift the torture pillar scenes directly from Hellraiser, to be honest. Yeah. The little inserts they have, they just kind of yes. dyed it red, but it's still the same thing. And you see the guys grabbing, like, bits of the flesh. of the... It's mm-hmm. crazy, because we've all seen p- things like Turkish Star Wars or 
Turkish Superman and whatever Italian Superman, and then now there's like uh, I I don't I don't know what what country is this from. I thought but it was Indonesia, but I'm not sure. Indonesia, yeah. Now we got an Indonesian so. Hellraiser, yeah. and it's I just found out about that a few months ago, and I was like, I think it was. I, friend... I saw it on Cathode TV in LA, so um, oh, which is okay. a, a streamed channel online. You can watch, get it from anywhere, which is kind of an interactive streamed thing. But it was so good, and the makeup yeah. again, the budget limit must have been tiny, but the makeup of Frank was really yeah, the, the solid. Frank it was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, was, it was fun. They even yeah, have so... little uh, stop motion animation sequences mm -hmm. making the little brain inside i was like what what is this wow. how is this a thing and nobody knows about it that's crazy yeah. no it's crazy so i mean i i was telling pete about it and pete didn't know and he was like oh my god i gotta have to check that out like you should it's great yeah. you know yeah. it was really really fun so um so if you uh want anything on the 80s or anything any ditties like that um you'll find me on on twitter um uh at vampire circa uh, v a m p i r e Sarika S o r c h a. I'm also on Instagram, even though I'm rubbish at it. Uh, you'll find me there. Same same username. So yeah, you'll find Fantastic. me. Fantastic. I'm terrible. Well, thank at, you, at, thank you uh, guys. I'm terrible at at Instagram too. I, I really am terrible at it. I, I think just, just... I get notifications that people are following me or sending me messages, and I'm like, oh, I I should probably check Instagram sometimes. It's one of those things. Well, I, I I came up of the age where I was like, I were just about remember Bebo and all the rest of it. In MySpace. I got Facebook and I got Twitter. After that, my brain was like, we're done. There's enough social media. Yeah. Kids. So you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, learning new ones is just do the same thing as Facebook, and I never never check Instagram. All right. The last thing I just want to bring up, in case you guys don't know, is we have a new Barker Cast interviews book. It is Yay, a four hundred plus page. Thank you. And uh, it, it talks mostly about Nightbreed. So this will have a lot of stuff with Nightbreed. Um, you'll have interviews with the cast and crew and uh, special effects artists and people like, uh, you know, Cliff McMillan uh, from uh, Shout Factory. Shout Factory. Uh, we've got mm -hmm. all sorts of things from uh, transcriptions from the event that we went to when the Nightbreed Director's Cut premiered in uh, the Crest in Westwood in LA. And we got a lot of good stuff here. So this book definitely might um, might be interesting for anybody who wants to know stuff about uh, how Occupy Median went through, what, uh, what uh, interesting st stories we have about Nightbreed. They're all in this book. Excellent. So yeah, Yay. we uh, definitely have this I one. Haven't, I, haven't put I think you guys might enjoy this yet. one as well. Yeah. Oh, congratulations I, on that. I know it's just recently published and um, I did see that notification. So that's brilliant. Well done. Because we know how hard it is to produce that kind of level of work. It's it's a huge undertaking. So well done. That's great. And I look forward to, to get my hands on it. We good. We started it in 2017. Yes. Yeah, that, that's about right for the pace of academic life as Carmen and I know. It <laughs> takes a long time to birth these things. Yeah. You know, Many so. hours of interviews went into this. And uh, nowadays we have AI and it's super easy to transcribe. But back then it was doing it was done by hand with help from some of our listeners. And we really appreciate all the work that was put into it. But anyway, not to take uh, the focus away from uh, from you guys, but we'll send you uh, we'll send you some uh, proof copies after oh, this. Thank you. Yeah. That's and wonderful. And I really appreciate all the time you guys did by joining us today. Oh, thank you. That was fantastic fun. And uh, and also thanks to Arrow, by the way, for producing such a beautiful box set. I mean, yeah, I absolutely. think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who didn't think it was just a, a box full of treasures, to be perfectly honest. So, yeah, um, amazing. Yeah. And for you guys for keeping going. Episode 441. That's commitment. <laughs> yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And we were on our, our 400th episode cleaning uh, cleaning up on our trivia contest. That's right, I was. <laughs> yes, I kind of. Yeah. And I remember I did you got in... two faux pas though as well. Don't worry, you know, it wasn't a clean, yeah. clean sweep. <laughs> and I remember yeah. you got in touch with, uh, I think it was either Barbie or Doug. Yes. For your That's 80s it. project back then. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. I've still got to follow up with Barbie and stuff. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it will continue to. I've been talking about the 80s since, if you know me, I've been talking about it as long as I've been alive. So, you know, it is, this is the, 
but it's 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 a project with lots of you know Barkarian tentacles coming out of it. You know, what I mean, there's lots of work on sequels and lots of work on, on directors who are not necessarily gothic and you know things like that. But it's um, yeah, if I'm recuperating the decade in terms of its its artistic merits at least. Anyway, I I always think it gets a bad rap and it shouldn't. It was actually a really pivotal decade, the last analog decade we had. So I think yes. that's quite important to think about it. You know, so and it produced some of the best things that we talk about all the time here. So why not? Yeah, I mean, for our generation, definitely has been, uh, you know, very formative. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you again to the two of you for being with us yeah, today. And you. congratulations on the featurette and all of your work. And keep us posted on your projects. We'd love to have yeah. you guys back again at some point. For sure. Thanks, guys. Thank Great. you. So, okay. Ryan, what's coming up next? All right. Oops. So, coming up next, we have, uh, we're, well, we'll, we'll I think our next one actually is going is going to be uh the Dead Pit. The Dead uh, Pit commentary, yeah. With uh with Ed Martinez will be will be talking Nina. about his will be doing a commentary for the that movie. So that'll be great. Yeah, the Dead Pit from Yeah. Check out some of the stuff that Ed sent to us as well from behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. We got some uh stuff that Ed sent us footage from behind the scenes of the movie so that's going to be yeah. interesting to get into and what uh, else do you have we'll, uh we'll continue our hellraiser boom comic series uh eat will do a commentary on evil dead 2 um jericho squad will continue more news and interviews and we're gonna cover we still plan on covering the hellraiser quartet of torment that's right because have you finished watching every single thing on that huge obelisk I have not. No, not yet. Right. It's it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of hours yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Commentary yeah. tracks and featurettes. It's it's the gift that keeps on giving for Hellraiser fans. Yeah. So um for those of you that don't know, uh our our um fundraiser this year is a Patreon. So for people who don't uh, who who uh, haven't uh, contributed yet, or do, if you if you want to help us out, uh, you can buy our book first and foremost. That would be that's that will help us out a lot. Um, and Jose, you finally just got a copy of our book. The one that you buy won't have that not for resale stripe on it. <clears throat> yes. But, oh yeah. This is so heavy. Yeah, it's got like here's the book pages. Yes, this is these are proofs. So they have this not for resale thing, but the real thing will not have that. This is my this is going to be my personal copy where I'm going to go through it and make sure I annotate if I find any other like typos or whatever. And then maybe maybe in the future we'll have a version two. I don't know. But for now, yeah. I think this is going to be it. And uh, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah. So that's that, work. and then and then of course our Patreon. So our Patreon has uh, has three tiers, right? There's well, there's the free tier, which I guess would be a fourth one, but but also at the at the five dollar tier, uh, you can get access to our our um, YouTube channel. That's that's uh you that you can't otherwise see, and at the um at the ten dollar tier, you get access to that. What well, to the to the YouTube channel, but also you can choose uh, content, things that we talk about. You might even be able to join us on an episode. Yeah, and, maybe uh, we'll do a few live live streams that will only be available on Patreon. Maybe just planning live streams, something yeah. like that. Maybe we could watch like some short film from Clive Barker together, something like that. We're just throwing ideas at this point, but uh, we definitely have a lot of ideas for content for our Patreon. Yeah, and um, and then of course we've got the advertising tier, uh, which is the fifteen dollar tier. So and uh, and so we want to do a shout out to uh, our the people that we've got on there so far, David Anderson, uh, and and then our new our newest one, Eric Van de Holt. Thank you, Eric Van de Holt. And now and our returning sponsor, Don Bertram, Celebrate Imagination. So Don Bertram has hey. pledged uh, to to sponsor us again. And basically, it's the, the the way Patreon works is we we haven't been on it long enough for them to allow us to to have people pay a yearly amount. So if once we're on there for three months, then people can do a yearly billing instead of monthly. 
And so as soon as that happens, then then he's going to, you know, he's going to sponsor us at the at the sure, that sure. Event. Yeah. So thank you again, Don Bertram. And that's so that his his uh, his sponsorship is started up again with us. So we really appreciate that. And um, yeah, and that's it. And this podcast having no beginning will have no end. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker Podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. You can chat with us on our Facebook BarkerCast listeners group, our Facebook page, Twitter, or our Discord server. The best way to support us is to buy our book, The BarkerCast Interviews, Occupy Midian, available in hardcover on Amazon and ebook on Amazon and Apple Books. Fundraiser 10 is all about Patreon this year. Become a patron to get access to exclusive stuff, pick an episode topic, and maybe even get cool stuff in the mail. You can also buy a t-shirt on our TeePublic store. Go to TeePublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Opening music by Ray Norrish. End credit music by Matt Furness. Thanks for listening.